Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. And she talks quite a bit about the bowhead, so that's kind of why we chose to to talk about them today. And a great a, another ocean-going species. What can they teach us? Because I found a really cool article talking about their lifespan as well, in that one of the issues with tracking a bowhead whale would be that they way outlive us. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. First episode of 2020, Angie. Happy New Decade, Chris. And to all of our listeners out there, thanks for sticking with us. Or if it's your first time, welcome. Yes, yes, I'm excited. I'm excited for the 20. I'm excited for this decade. I am so excited because I think the world's going to make a turn. I think the world's going to make a turn. Yeah, I think a lot of what we've been talking about in 2017 and 2018 really started to gear up in 2019, where a lot of the issues endangered animals are facing were starting to be in the main media on um, mm-hmm. on big websites and making making the news if you will and so it was really hopeful uh that people were starting to pay attention there seemed to be a lot of social media movement awareness people sharing articles and of course joining our facebook chats and just yeah it just really felt like there was a lot more momentum in 2019 than when we first started the pod way way back in 2017 <laughs> it was at the end of the, but truth be told i think it was at the very yeah. end of 2017 that we started right so um, yeah but yeah i it's it's i think times they be a change in i do i do i do i think I, I think yeah i know they have to but uh, they absolutely have to but i think you're right i think the the media I think social media is playing a big role in that, you know, not just like our listeners sharing stories with us, you know, everybody's sharing stories. Like right now in the news, Australia is burning down and it's in everything, you know, everywhere you turn on the news, social media feeds. So the world's paying attention and people are like, why, why? Yeah. And there's some really, some really big uh, macro influencers and stars uh, that are stepping up to make donations. And of course Mm -hmm. the Australia zoo is just, incredible um the animals that they're rescuing and the money that they're Mm -hmm. donating and so but yeah i feel like people are paying more attention and um hopefully once we put the fire out figuratively Mm -hmm. we'll continue to work towards global climate change to help protect other species and get this ball rolling to put the fire out for so many species in trouble right 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 and we're going to return to Australia soon, but today we're returning to the Arctic because we're kind of on this snow, cold animal kick through the winter season, and we are talking about the bowhead whale. Yes. Which is, yeah, ba- it, big baleen whale. Yeah, we're back in the ocean. It feels good to be in the ocean, and it definitely feels appropriate to be in the Arctic Ocean this time of year. And yes, Chris, I also have an amazing interview that I recently did that, that should complement this bowhead whale episode very well. I got to speak with Dr. Bathsheba DeMuth, who is an environmental historian from Brown University that wrote one of the top picks for nature. It's like, uh, it was voted in 2019 one of the top 10 science must reads science science mm-hmm. books and it's called the floating coast so that talks about the environment and species and the culture and the indigenous people that live in the areas of not only the US up in Alaska but also um in Russia as well so really mm-hmm. cool perspective telling both sides of the stories and in the end it's all about the animals and the environment so just an amazing interview you'll have to check out for sure. Yeah, no, look for that. Look for that. That should be out soon. And she talks quite a bit about the bowhead, so that's kind of why we chose to to talk about them today. And a great, a, another ocean-going species, one that, you know, Angie, reading some of the, the history on them, talking about historian, was commercial whaling drove these animals down to less than 3,000 by the 1920s. I mean, almost drove them to extinction. Yes, they have a really crazy, fascinating story uh, from the past couple hundred years of, yeah, how they're 
pretty much almost wiped out. And then people started paying attention to not wanting them to be extinct. And so, and so measures were put forward to protect them and to uh, reduce the whaling. And then ultimately to only allow indigenous peoples to take a few whales, I think every couple of years. Mm -hmm. So that's that whole saga and story is, is documented in the book. And it's, it's just really, really fascinating from both the U S perspective, but then also from the Russia perspective. So Dr. DeMuth does a really good job telling all the sides of the stories. And so, and from an, and from the animal or, and, and, or environments perspective. And yes, bowhead whales, she said, were one of her favorites. And they're fascinating. They're fascinating. Yeah. And to truth be told, Chris, I, I first felt really bad before I, when I did my research for the interview, because I didn't really know what a bowhead whale was. And <laughs> <laughs> come to find out, Spoiler alert, it's the second largest whale in the world. It's only I smaller know. than the blue whale. We'll get their size and specs here coming up really quick. But yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I can, I, the humpback. And of course we did the sperm whale, which was one of my favorite pods mm. uh, of this yeah. year. And of course, orcas. And I write the, we'll talk a lot about the right whales today because mm -hmm. uh, the bowhead whales in this, in a similar family. So, yeah, not feeling too smart, but <laughs> of course, <laughs> well, I did my research and obviously now I've learned so yeah. much and this is probably going to be a long pot. I'll try to make it short because they are so yeah. fascinating and they are. And I do have to stick up for myself a little bit because the taxonomist and the geneticists that, that do a lot of this categorizing Mm -hmm. have kind of gone back and forth if the bow head whale is part of the right whale family. Right. So right, we'll right, talk right. a little bit about that when we get to evolution, the different species and things like that. And so I don't think anyways, if you're, if you're listening to this podcast or you're like, I don't, I don't know what a bow head whale is. You will, by the end of this podcast, you'll fall in love yes. with them. And yeah. And so, and you're not alone. Like I said, I think they probably aren't, you know, they don't maybe get as much buzz as up in the Arctic as the narwhals or the belugas. Mm -hmm. We still need to do belugas mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. yes, I'm excited. It well, I knew what a bowhead was only because, only because that looking way back when, before we even started this podcast, I remember watching a documentary on it and it said these were the longest living mammals on earth and i thought oh okay cool you know and, and i thought oh you know what 120 i mean i know tortoises but that's not a mammal you know i'm thinking of mammals humans can live to be over 100 i'm thinking maybe 120 you know 120 years is pretty old for a mammal oh yeah i didn't realize these things can live to be over 200 years old like what yes a mammal yes so we're we're gonna cover that a little bit later because there's a lot of dorky science <laughs> attached to it, which and, uh, is fascinating. Yeah, and, and quick funny story: Chris and I were actually dorking out about this aging process of aging for a half an hour before we started the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he read these papers, emailing oh, them back and forth to each other. No, check out. Well, what about? The, I didn't, huh? I and know, so, I know. anyways, we will spare you. We will get you the cliff notes. We promise, uh, and yeah. we will read our own dorky aging stuff on the side <laughs> or we'll put on our show notes as well too so. yeah you can read it too you can read it too so yeah before we get going real quick uh, you know just a thank you to brad simon john who joined us on patreon hey guys so thank, thank you. you guys yay uh, it means so much to us and also paul from varmints Hi, who paul. reached out to us again thanks buddy. thank you for supporting us go check out their podcast it's hilarious and just really quickly you know some people are like what's patreon just so you know, it's, it's where we can put special content, you know, you know, for at minimum a, a cappuccino a month, you know, you get access to our special Patreon only episodes. We just released Red Kangaroos. So that's on there. We did that, uh, right before Christmas. We released that one out. You have meerkats on there. Fun. Angie just said sperm whale. I mean, sperm whale was, was a blast. Sloth, like I want <laughs> sloth is the best. And yeah, there's, a, we also there's had, a viral video right now of a sloth like just walking on the ground because they don't do very uh, well on the ground and they look kind of goofy. No. <laughs> but anyways, we talk about that in the pod. Uh, yeah. It's fun. Yeah. 
And we did have Cheetah and Great White Shark on there, but we released that later to the general audience because we just wanted to show that the quality on the Patreon episodes is the same as this one. You know, we throw our hearts into it. We do the research and then post it up there for them. So thank you for our supporters. You know, it helps support us, helps us. You know, we're going to do some little bit of advertising, just pushing the message out there and also give back to conservation, which I will put up the, the poll this week. For our Patreon only folks that can decide where we send a check each month uh, based on a percentage of what you give us. Yeah, so maybe Australia this month. We shall see. Uh, it's probably, yeah. probably. Yeah, especially with the kangaroos. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for, for your support. And then, yes, Chris, I always like to mention too if you don't want to spend a dollar or five or 10 or whatever, I totally get it. Uh, but what you can, one of the things that's free you can really do to help us out is go. Is to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes or whatever your listening device is. And you could be the first person to review us on iTunes in 2020. So let that be you, and then we'll give you a shout out and all your friends on the podcast as well. So do us a huge favor, and that would be awesome. And I got to give a shout out to Leo. Remember when I, a few episodes ago I said Leo reviewed us on iTunes? And said it would be awesome if we did extinct animals, but then accidentally left us a one star. Oh. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Leo went back and made it five stars. So thank oh, you, Leo. <laughs> thanks, buddy. That's awesome. <laughs> that, was, that was hilarious. So now I'm like, okay, maybe we will do an extinct animal and I know which one I want to do. I wonder if Angie can guess. Um, Tasmanian tiger. <laughs> <laughs> it's not extinct. I'm telling you, it's not extinct. Or a mammoth. They will find them. They're probably tied for a mammoth. Yeah, yeah there's some cool yeah, ones for but- sure. Yeah, Tazzy, Tazzy I don't want to do a quagga. Um, yeah. All right, well, let's focus on yeah, the present. Yeah. Let's save the animals okay. yeah, from yeah. extinction. So, Right. We don't want to get there. And so we, we covered snowy owls a few weeks ago, which I just still love. I look at those pictures of them, and I'm just in love with them. And, you know, their story and, and how the, the breakdown of the Arctic is, is pushing them to Hawaii of all places. Like, this bird migrated to Hawaii. was insane down to Texas, down to Florida. Well, I talk a little bit about what's going on in the Arctic. So not to go more in depth of that, but I just wanted to explain a little bit further because I did read a a good article out of Nature, which Angie and I have always said Nature is one of the top scientific publications in the universe on Earth. It's like like the American football, like the Patriots of... Who lost? (laughs) They did Um, lose, but (laughs) when they were the peak of the dynasty... It may not be yes, over yet, yes. but yes, no, they they we'll are see. the creme de la creme of scientific research. Yeah. I mean, you get published in Nature, it, it's the top science in the world, like period. Well, and that's why it's so cool that Nature has said that uh, Dr. Bashiva DeMuth's book, Floating Coast, right. is a must read for 2019. Like, booyah. Good plug. Good plug. No, it's true, though. It's so such an honor. Such an honor. And then uh, we got to talk to her. Or you did. You did a phenomenal job. So this article was called Arctic Amplification is Caused by Sea Ice Loss Under Increasing Carbon Dioxide. This was published last year. And what I found this study fascinating is it is a a model looking at where we are today. Well, they obviously looked at the past, where we are today and where we're going with sea ice in the Arctic. And what we know is the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else in the world. You know, this really more so than Antarctica too, but the poles are, are warming up quicker and that's why we're getting the sea lo- the loss of ice. And in the Arctic, it's a phenomenon known as the Arctic amplification. So if, if you don't know, you know, what happens is those poles, that white ice reflects the radiation and sunlight back out into the atmosphere, Right. When there's ocean water, it absorbs that radiation and that heat, and it actually stores it. So you go through this cycle where the heat radiation is absorbed by the water, or it's reflected by light, right? So as we lose ice, there's more heat being trapped in the Arctic. I mean, that's the bottom line, what's going on. Yeah. Right. It's basically there's less ice, so less of it's being reflected back and it's being absorbed 
which in turn warms up the Arctic even more and you lose more ice. So you're in this runaway chain reaction almost. You know, it's called this outgoing long wave radiation, which I read and I was like, okay, that was fun. But <laughs> thermal radiation, you know, <laughs> I was like, what? So what this paper do does, which is interesting, look at sea ice loss over the next 200, 300 years. Okay. And it's scary. I mean, it's scary. The results are scary. So what they what they found in these simulations, and they ran multiple simulations based on current trends, is we the sea ice loss rate will peak around the year 2070. So you're talking of 50 years. But global warming is going to continue, you know, at this rate. And they, I think they're predicting by the late 22nd century, global warming should peak a little bit. But they said by the end of this century, the end of the century, Angie, so in 80 years, there will be no Arctic sea ice from the months of July to October. Oh, that's nuts. None. Zero. Oh. Where there is some now today. It's not completely sure, ice-free. of course. But by the end of this century, that will be a thing. You know, because I'm, I'm looking at that graph I, I looked at a few weeks ago. At its lowest, you're still looking at, I mean, here, 4 million square kilometers of sea ice. Okay, in, in today or last year, 2012, that's actually 2012. So, but yeah, 2019, last year, at the end of summer, there was about 4 million square kilometers still. Well, the end of the century, there'll be zero, zero. Hmm. So, so then you can imagine how much of that thermal radiation or, or those outgoing radiation, what did I call it? Outgoing long wave radiation yeah, is being long trapped. Wave. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the data that that's kind of scary in the 23rd century. And all of us will be long gone, but you're talking, I don't know how many generations, but five kids, generations, kids, kids, kids won't. Yeah, I know down oh, great, the line. Great. great grades. Yeah. Sea ice will be less than 20% of the Arctic Ocean, even in the coldest part of the year, where it's upwards, I think 80, 90% of it is frozen over, less than 20% will be covered. And then temperatures will be like up to 70 degrees in, this, in the summers, where today it's like around 50 in the winter is a high. So you you're mean, talking a huge you drastic the increase. It's 50 in the summer. Yeah, today. And it could be as high as 70 degrees is what they're predicting as hot That's as. That's nuts. Yeah. So uh, to bring this home, how does it affect Arctic species? I mean, when you're talking about not only reduction in pack sea ice, but you're talking about all these food webs up there, which we're going to talk about today. You know, well, looking and at, all that water's got to go somewhere. Right, right. So, and changing ocean out, currents. Cities. Yeah, well, temperature. Yeah. 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 And well, Dr. DeMuth touches on that when I, and about why people should care about mm -hmm. global climate change. And she's like, oh, even if you don't necessarily care about the Arctic animals per se, mm -hmm. it's impacting you currently right now. Yeah. Be yeah. Because of, uh, because of the ocean currents and the winds and things like that. And obviously it's not very dramatic or it is, but it's maybe not enough to, uh, for people to pay attention, but Hopefully they will. And that's why this new decade, 2020s, it's the mm -hmm. Roaring 20s. Mm -hmm. We should come up with some cool hashtag. Yeah, like yeah. The Roaring Environment or Roaring for, like, <laughs> Saving the Lions. I don't know. Yeah. Obviously, I'm just free living over here and it's not good. <laughs> free basing, isn't it? Is free, basing, free basing, yeah. Free, yeah. free basing. So yeah, I don't even know what it's called, clearly. So yeah, because it's not too late. And that's the thing. Mm. Um there's definitely impacts that we're not going to be able to undo, but we can minimize control yeah. if it keeps going. And yeah. of course, we're not climate scientists. We don't pretend to be, uh, but we do know how to read data and understand um, this language of science and how to read scientific articles. Uh, and so this is what it's saying, that it is, mm -hmm. it is not good. And mm -hmm. the reason... Chris, bless his heart, went through that whole article there and gave us some nice cliff notes is because we care about animals. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously our main passion. And that's why we do this podcast. And not that I don't care about people. Obviously, I care about people as well. But a lot of animals are going extinct at a crazy mm -hmm. rate that 
historically has only been seen with some major catastrophes. Mm -hmm. So we need to work together to stop that and to try to help it. And not only will we help animals, but we'll also help ourselves as well. Yeah. So I mean, it's, you know, tying this all together, like, you know, we talk about snowy owls and the effects and how they're ranging further south. And I'm trying to tie this into bowhead whales because they are baleen whales. We're going to talk about that, but they, they eat zooplankton. Well, this is going to drastically alter the biome up there. So when you start at the, the bottom of the food chain, these single-celled algae diatoms, you know, these are protists that live, live in the Arctic Sea. These are eaten by zooplankton. Zooplankton are eaten by these baleen whales. So, you know, but also cod eats it. And there's, you know, the orcas that eat the cod. All of these species depend on that. So the Arctic food webs in, in, in dire straits. It's in dire straits. And that's, that's kind of where the whole point is that it does definitely is going to impact the bowhead whale because these things have evolved to be in this freezing cold environment, Angie. Um Oh, like they're blubber, Chris. They're <laughs> blubber. It's so, like, so describe thick. them. Yeah, let's describe them. But you know, they they they're meant to live in that cold water, and when that cold water goes away, their food goes away. These whales will go away. You know, they're 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 going to struggle to survive. And these things are crazy looking, right? I mean, just crazy looking. Well, yeah. These, well, they're just so cool. They're the second largest whale in the world. They're humongous yeah. and they're gentle giants. Like when we get to nutrition, we'll talk about their diet and they basically just swim along collecting food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Chris, their name bowhead comes from their bow shaped mouth. Their mouth is the largest of any cetaceans. Mm -hmm. So big, it's even bigger than a blue whale's. Mm -hmm. It ha measures 300 to 450 centimeters in vertical length. And their skull is humongous. They have this massive triangular skull. And it takes up a third, about a third of their total body length. Mm -hmm. And it's it's <laughs> curved. And this, it's the, the reason, well, one of the purposes of this massive skull is to break through the ice. They can break through ice up to almost two feet, I was reading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to get air when they need it. So that's insane, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they're just beautiful. They're large. They have a dark colored body and then they have a cute white chin or lower jaw. Mm -hmm. It's pretty charming. Yeah. And so some things, they don't have a dorsal fin, which is rare for cetaceans. Yeah. You, know, you talked about, I mean, their baleen plates. I have so much data on the, on the size. The size is enormous. <laughs> So the baleen plates have a maximum length of 13 feet or four meters. Like that's each baleen plate that's taller right. than your house. Yes. Right. They, they have their, their flukes can measure 25 feet from or 7.6 meters from tip to tip. Their, their flippers are about as tall as me, six feet or 1.8 meters in length. Awesome. Overall 60 feet in length. And I've read some have them at like 120,000 pounds. Most have them at 200,000 or more. So you're talking 100 tons. Yeah, massive. 100 tons. Massive whale. Massive whale. Now, or a, blue, or 100,000 kilograms. Yeah. More or less. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned their blubber, which was like up to 19 inches thick. <laughs> yeah. Almost, like, I, I rounded up to two feet because, yeah, but yes. Yeah. yeah. Still, I mean, and, I love it. I love everything. Man, I wish I could have. I wish I was allowed to even <laughs> two have feet like a blubber. No, <laughs> not two feet, but how about like a couple inches? Like that'd be great. Well, we'll, we'll get to blubber a little bit later. I actually did a little research on blubber, but they need that blubber, Angie, because they range in the Arctic. You know, yes. they're the, but the, the Bering Sea. Can you say some of these? The Chukai Sea, the Beaufort Sea, Hudson Bay, Fox Basin, Baffin Bay. I was going to go with Hudson Bay. That's going to be the, <laughs> yeah, the Bering Sea. Yeah. Uh, the, those are some of the names. So good for you. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but off Greenland, but don't really range north of Russia. Like there's just, you know, not, not a big range there. Probably because mm -hmm. there's not as much fish in, or fish, not as much plankton, things like that. There. And since their population has rebounded somewhat, if you will, they are considered 
least concerned by the IUCN. However, in the U.S., they're still protected under the Endangered Species Act because we took those numbers down so low. But there's really only like five breeding stocks of them. And they're mm-hmm. really, they're secluded into a few, five different areas. And so within the five different areas, they're most, they're either critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. So the Salvbar population is critically endangered. The Sea of Oshtak subpopulation is endangered. Baffin Bay Davis Strait stock is endangered. Hudson Bay, that's an easy one to say. Mm-hmm. That's vulnerable, mm-hmm. um, estimated to be maybe a thousand individuals. And that was in 2005. So it could hopefully is more now. And then right. the Bering, Chucky, Buford stock, um, that has less, uh, they don't know the exact numbers, but right now it's considered least concerned. Right. So, right. yeah, I mean, when you think about that, as far as how they used to be all over the Arctic right. uh, and right. that we've, you know, humans and not, not just in the U S but in other countries hunted mm-hmm. them because they were so valuable for their blubber. I mean, that was, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. was like the oil of the 18th century, right? Yep. 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 Like we're exploiting the earth today with fossil mm-hmm. fuels, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and of course the indigenous re- peoples of the Arctic region have been hunting them his- historically f- forever, but yeah. they weren't taking too many of them. And they, right. were, uh, right. and they also, I, Dr. DeMuth does a fabulous job in the interview just talking about how the indigenous culture is so much more in tune with mm-hmm. uh, wildlife and the environment because they have to to survive. Mm-hmm. And so because mm-hmm. they are so in tune to the environment that they live, that they need to live in, that they have they have a lot more understanding of just the circle of life and not yeah. over hunting something, um, not exploiting things. Where of course, when capitalism comes in on the U.S. side and the Russian side, it's a mm-hmm. whole different ball game in the whaling industry. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, even even today, you know, if you look up, reading some of the the research this past week, you know, World Wildlife Fund talking about the bowheads and how you know our current administration is opening up more exploration for oil and gas and how that can lead to, and I didn't include this in the the previous talk, but I'll throw it in here that they were talking about, you're talking about an extreme environment where it's very difficult to, you know, drill for oil and gas. And then if you have a spill, there's no way to go clean it up. It's in one of the most extreme environments on earth. So it's just a, a lose, lose, except for people's pocketbooks. Anyways, except for a few people's pocket yeah a few few mm-hmm. now we talked about you know the the whole food web you know these play a critical role in that Angie, i'm gonna tell you one of the things and when we get to the aging thing that they they do know bowhead whales can live to be over 200 years so one of the things you always like to talk about is how can that affect us sure and so i found a, a really cool paper and i'm just going to give you the title is and this was in cell which is another top top journal? Yeah, that's definitely. Yeah. What I don't what, yeah. what what's it's another a, football dynasty to go off of my analogy? Uh, not, not my uh, L.A. Rams. <laughs> not my Lions, unfortunately. <laughs> the Rams were good in oh, the day, but they're in St. Louis. Um. Yeah. Anyways, okay, I'm out of my yeah. my my Liverpool. Uh, there we go. Soccer. There you we'll go. go soccer. I like it. <laughs> they're the Liverpool of science. There you go. So. But this this title was was really cool. Insights into the evolution of longevity from the bowhead whale genome. And what they did is they identified genes that were positively selected or mutations that help them age and survive aging and links to cancer. And we went back to the elephants five, six pods ago. Where we talked about the anti-cancer genes that we found in elephants. So bowhead whales can teach us a lot about aging and some of the diseases that we have in the human population. Yes. Give me some of those anti-cancer genes because unfortunately it runs in my family. So yeah. Yeah. So there's a reason to care, you know, again, an an animal that can help humanity. Yeah. Well, and obviously besides the anti-cancer genes, just the longevity as far and healthy and is just incredible uh, as far as what what we could begin to understand about how they stay healthy how their cells stay healthy that long mm-hmm. and 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 we're starting to the first step 
as Chris mentioned, is learning about their genome and learning what genes tied with aging and how those genes are influenced over time. Because I found a really cool article talking about their lifespan as well, and that one of the issues with tracking a bowhead whale would be that they way outlive us for the most part. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I wouldn't want that uh, PhD project, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, would last a mm-hmm. uh, uh, couple, um, a long time. And so that's one of the problems, but they do, they did find one individual that was estimated to be about 211 years old. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. they, I mean, they think easily right. they can live to 200, which is just incredible. I mean, it's definitely the <laughs> longest living mammal on earth. I mean, do we, do we want to dork out on the aging right now? Yes, we do because <laughs> we it's okay. so it's crazy Let's because they so they're the longest living mammal on Earth, but mm-hmm. they don't know their true life expectancy. We don't know for sure. No, um, obviously no. we can't keep them under human care, and like I said, it's just it's these things are hard. But a really interesting study out of researchers from Australia have done a groundbreaking like genetic study where they're talking about a lifespan clock and they can predict how long Mm -hmm. an animal will live basically solely based on its DNA. And Mm -hmm. they analyzed the genetic code of over 250 vertebrates and they found 42 genes, which can help predict the life of the animal. And the bowhead whale, according to their prediction is 268 years. Wow. So wow. over 50 years wow. more than the current whale. And of course, I had to dork out and read the whole article. It has, <laughs> it has mm-hmm. a lot to do. And I'm sure science is controversial, so it would be interesting to see. And this, this just came out in December 2019. I, um, I think it was in scientific reports. So it will be interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there will be some scientists that maybe counter it or whatever. But um, they are basically doing DNA aging based on DNA epigenetic changes involving D- involving DNA methylation and looking at okay. CPG sites and promoter regions, which mm-hmm. not to bore anybody, but that's an important um, place where methylation happens and they can, and researchers have ways to predict patterns and understand what methylation, what has, how the DNA has changed over time. So it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not how your genes, your genes don't change your genotype. It's how the phenotype type of, um, of your DNA changes over time. Right. So So just, uh, the layman's terms, the genotype is the directions, right? The recipe A to Z on what you are. The phenotype is what you see. Sure. So you have everything written down in the, in the DNA, that's your genotype, but what you actually see is the phenotype. So when you have epigenetic changes, it can change it, what the phenotype yeah, looks like. Yeah, it turns, right? it turns so, yeah. certain things on and off at certain times. Right, it's right. really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. But uh, thank you, Chris. Your, your cliff notes are just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to. Tonight. I'm like, the, our audience out there, they're like, oh, what? CPG <laughs> Islands? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I know. No, we have a lot of smart listeners. I... But, anyways, yes, they live for a long time. We don't even know how long they live. It's really incredible. Well, you know, and then really what got them interested in bowhead whales was, you know, the, like you said, the, the, the indigenous people, say in Alaska. And this is where it started was in Alaska. They would go and, like you said, they were able to hunt bowhead whales. And the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission allows 10 villages to take about 40 bowheads each year. Okay. So maybe a little bit more than I would like, but, you know, that's their decision. And these are people that have lived off these whales for thousands of years. Now, what they found is when they were harvesting and and really cutting the whale up was they found these old stone tips in the whales, you know, scarred over. And they're like, we haven't used these tips in a hundred years, you know, from the 1800s. And so they went and it's really the scientists out of Scripps Institute of Oceanography in La Jolla, which I just went. What, what? Yeah, yeah, me and my friend Pip, we just went by it the other day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just drove by it. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I just, uh, I love that place in La Jolla. And he was using, and this is what we were dorking out before we started. 
was the levels of a spartic acid, which is an amino acid in the eye lens and also teeth. Now we can talk about that process here in a second, but what he found was five males that were harvested. One was 91, one was 135, one was 159, one was 172. The oldest was 211 years old, plus or minus, I think, 30 years. So it could have been up to that 240, 250-year-old wow, right. mm-hmm. range mm-hmm. that you were mm-hmm. talking about. Uh, the the other whales, the oldest, when we go back to blue whales, got two years ago, was 110 or 114 for fin whale. And if you remember, do you remember how they measured that? It was like this... It's the grossest looking thing ever. <laughs> it's remember the it was it earwax? No. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, it was oh, earplug. Oh, from yes. the deep dark corners Good of job. my mind. Thank you. I didn't even I didn't even look you remember. Yeah, I didn't even pull up any notes. Wow, there's so much Yeah. So much random facts in my brain. I love it. Oh, they have this long wax in their ears, <laughs> which you know you pull out. But that doesn't work for bowheads. They can't measure it. So they he developed this aspartic acid technique. Yes, yes, and it and it's based on my favorite analytical chemistry stuff uh, because aspartic acid yes. comes in two different in, in tanomeres, which are basically mirror-like images. So either the L form or the D form. I don't really know what L and D stand for. Uh, I need my chemist. I need Cecilia or one of my chemist friends to tell me. But anyways. Oh, it's, yeah, the mirror image. They're yeah, mirror images yeah. of each other. And basically, as an animal ages, the fluid in their eye, the aspartic acid in their eye, shifts the ratio from D to L. And really smart people understand the ratios of how much aspartic acid should be in the D form or the L form. And over time... They basically go from the center of the eye and move out like rings in a tree and do, of course, some modeling based on the ratio of D to L and tanomeres of aspartic acid in the fluid of the eye. Incredible. It's the lens. Yeah, it's the the lens, lens, the lens of the eye. I mean, it's just like, who? this is just awesome. That's science. Science is so cool. That's science. Cool. I mean, yeah. I don't know how you could just yeah. listen to us talk about aging an- the animals from the lens of their eyes and not want to be a scientist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's Crazy. fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. Just to even think about like how to develop that technique and always blows me away. Or, and, you know, or be a scientist that saves animals even better. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're doing. But so, yeah. So they're using chemistry, analytical chemistry which Angie was using to save rhinos to understand these bowhead whales and use those techniques and maybe other species to kind of age them. So it, again, why care? You know, that's, that's huge. That's huge. Yes. Yes. And then also you should care too, because they're definitely a popular uh, whale to watch um, when you go, whether you're on a, a cruise or if you go whaling, if you get the chance to go up into the Arctic region, they're definitely... A, don't go whaling. Or, sorry, don't sorry. go whaling. <laughs> don't go whaling. <laughs> Whale watching. Whale watching. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Don't go whaling, don't go please. Whaling. Conservation, no. conservation tip of the week. Don't go whaling. <laughs> See, ever. I helped you. <laughs> Should we move on to evolution? Oh, it's because I have the song. Sailing, sailing. Da, 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 da. Anyways. Not um, whaling. Not whale not whaling. whale okay. watching. Yeah. And be like, yes, I'm a whale watcher. Like something like that. I got to come up with a different song. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And that's actually, uh, I just ripped that off from a uh, Wheel of Fortune commercial. So uh, anyways. <laughs> whaling, whaling. Here we go. <laughs> whale watching. Be a wheel, not yes. a, yeah, it's from wheel watching. Be a whale watcher. Yeah. There you go. There you go. And from an economic point of view, whale watching mm-hmm. is definitely one of the most popular experiencers uh experiences travelers can cross off their bucket list in the Arctic and yeah. you know, of the few whales that live in the Arctic year round, the bowhead whale is by far the biggest and they're definitely one of the most sought after species to see. So yeah. I know it's yeah, definitely, definitely on my bucket list. Go, that's yeah. for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I'm going to go through evolution quickly because we've covered this in multiple pods about whales and cetaceans. 
And then, and then we'll do the species and how they're kind of like kind of related to the right rail. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, just the Mesno kids, that was a carnivore with hooves. I mean, that's my favorite. That's why I just bring it up because Angie's like, that's makes why I favorite. love cetaceans. They're actually hoof stock that swim. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Circle. So they're, they're, re- they're amazing. They're re- related to artidactyls, the even toed hoof animals, you know, closely related to hippos. So you're talking 60 million years of evolution in the whales. The baleen whales start emerging and they're, they're, they're definitely one of the older whale families, you know, about 35 million years during the Eocene. And the, the newest, youngest whale population or whales are the narwhal and belugas and porpoises, which were about 12 million years ago. So baleen whales have been around for a while. Now, they belong, or baleen whales belong to the lineage of Mysticeti. Mm-hmm. And these are just filter feeding cetaceans. There's 15 species of baleen whales. We've covered the blue. We're covering now the bowhead or right whale. I'm going to get to it in a second is very re- closely related, but different species. Humpback, minkies, th- those are the baleen whales. And now within that is the baleenidae. And this is the right whales and the bowhead whales. Right whales, Angie said this way back, I think, in the blue whale episode that sailors used to call them or whalers used to call them the right whale because that was the whale you wanted to harpoon and kill to get the blubber. So that's where they earned their name. Bowheads were thought to be right whales, but through genetics and later, Actually, earlier than genetics, but genetics has confirmed this. Bowheads are actually their own species, mm-hmm. own genus. Yes. Yeah. So the right whales belong to Ubelina, where the bowheads are Belina, and then the bowhead scientific name is Belina mysticetus. I like that. Very good, mysticetus. Yeah. So that. Yeah. So there you go. So so part of that been around for a long, long time. Now, since we were talking about aging. My fun fact of the week, Angie, mm-hmm. what is the oldest living animal on earth? I know there's a shark. It's really old, like 500 years. The Greenland shark. Maybe? Greenland shark. Nope. Nope. Um, it's got to be a plant. Nope. Oh, did you, did animal. you say animal or what did you say? Animal. Oh, you said animal. Yeah. <laughs> so that animal. would rule out plant. Yeah, yeah. You didn't say organism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, animal. Yeah. Probably like a coral, maybe? Face palm. <laughs> Face palm. Because I'm so smart. Episode 68. Oh, we didn't do corals. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 68. Um, that was a while ago. Oh. One of the most beautiful pictures. Um, hold on. I mean, I'm going to put you back on. I took you off video for a second. Uh, I'm gonna put okay. you on video, and we're gonna do charades. I'm gonna okay, show me what, show me how it moves. Say a pretty what's, picture. What's, okay, here a we go. Tortoise. Okay. Here we go. Okay, think of one of the pu- the prettiest graphics we've ever posted. Rob Lang underdone comics, and it's like oh jellyfish. Yes. Okay. Very good. The- I'm gl- Which one? I don't know, but I'm glad you're not my charade <laughs> partner. Which one did we cover? We cover. <laughs> what did we cover? Uh, uh, a va- we did a they vampire can live squid. Forever. No. Colossal jellyfish. <laughs> they can- no, we covered immortal jellyfish. Immortal. Oh, duh, you- <laughs> immortal. That's okay. That's yes. when I was saying coral. I was thinking of, in my brain. I was thinking of polyps. No. Like the yeah, polyp oh, good. thing. Okay. That phase that they're in, in their polyps. <laughs> Give it to you. It's late. It's oh, late. It's so late. I got it. Uh, it's after the holidays. I'm a few yeah, pounds heavier. Definitely have less dollars in my pocket. And clearly, yeah. a memory for yeah. uh, not. I have to go back and look for that pod. <laughs> I'm more jellyfish. I'm good on yes, charades. That's, that's good. And yes, I'm not picking you for my charades partner. <laughs> for well, I just record. gave it to you. You said jellyfish. I know. It, was, jellyfish. it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. No. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, the immortal jellyfish. Technically can live forever. We don't know the age of one out there. It, it could be millions of years old. We it a great episode, fun episode that obviously is forgettable for some people, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. 
invertebrates are hard for me. They're very hard. I love they them, are. but they're they hard are. for me. Okay. And then the, I thought that this was cool. The second, the Greenland shark, I think it was like two or 300 years old. The second oldest is the ocean quahong, which is a clam. Okay. I and thought, see, that's, I was picturing things like that yeah. in the ocean. That's, yeah. that doesn't make yeah. it right. That doesn't make my wrongness right. Well, because we don't have an age on a immortal jellyfish, so we don't know. But this thing, they do have an age. This thing, it was dredged off Iceland. And while they were trying to count the shell, the growth lines, it, they killed it. Mm. But this thing was, they called it the Ming clam because it was alive during the Ming de- dynasty. Wow. Estimated to be 507 years old. That's nuts. Yeah. Crazy. 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 So, you know, we, we talked about the life cycle bowhead whales 211 years is is the estimate you know amazing animals that you know talking about how they feed and angie kind of opened up about that they just go they open up this gaping mouth which i think you can drive an suv through it is is what i read (laughs) wow it's so wide wow that they and they just go and they filter feed right Mm -hmm. zooplankton is basically what what they do so when they open their mouth, they, they take in about two tons of food a day. Yes. Two tons. Yes. That's insane. Yes. That's insane. Crazy, right? Ugh. And so if and, you do the math, yeah. they do have different seasonal uh, feeding patterns. Mm-hmm. But if they're two tons a day and in a year over 100 tons. And what's really interesting, if they're taking up to two tons of food a day, the majority of their feeding takes place in the summer months. And so annually, it's about 100 tons of food. Right. A lot. Right. Because, yeah, they, they eat it that ton and then they they live off their blubber, which I'm going to talk about here next, during those lean months, you mm-hmm. know, and then use that as energy reserves and then they go feed. But when you're talking about keeping nature in balance, I mean, you know, not only are they keeping the zooplankton in check, but... What happens when all that zooplankton dies off or goes further south? Mm-hmm. You know, like we talked about, and this is sticking with me. Shout out to Stephanie Arney and the African penguins, you know, and I'm telling that story to anybody that will listen now that, you know, that current that we talked about off South Africa, where the schools of fish used to be 40 kilometers off the coast are now 70, 80 kilometers off the coast. And these poor little birds have to forage further and further. And that's why they're dying out. You know, there's not enough food. So again, that's why we have to keep our eyes to the Arctic and we need to fight this climate change because you start taking this out of the, the ecosystem. It's just, ugh, it's hor- horrible to think what will happen. Horrible. Oh, yeah. It just, well, everything is just so interconnected. And even from, people probably don't think about it, but whale feces interestingly enough, mm-hmm. is really important for the the bottom of the ocean and the organisms that live way down there. And mm-hmm. that's what they a lot of what they feed off of. And carcasses too, of course, a drop down and things like that. But I mean, I mean, unfortunately, not many people are fighting for the ocean critters of the deep, dark, deep, dark ocean. But they're really important. And they've been here for who knows how long. And it may not seem like it, but a bowhead whale is really important to those organisms, mm-hmm. big and small. Uh, mm-hmm. So it is, it's really, it's, it's, it's incredible when you really start thinking about it, what eats what and how this affects that. And if there's, this is out of balance, what will happen? A lot of it we don't know, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I think a lot, we don't want to know. I mean, and so when reading about bowheads and their nutrition, Besides eating zooplankton, they'll eat other epibenthic organisms and crustaceans and things like that. And they can f- filter these small crustaceans up to five, 50,000 per minute. 50,000 yeah, per minute. It's, gotta, it's just incredible. It's got to be insane. It's just... To, to get two tons a day, it's got to be nuts. Yeah. It's got to be nuts. And they just, yeah. they just hang out floating around. It's just eating, filtering. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good life we, right we could probably use yeah and who knows maybe we could use some of their filtering technology to help us clean water systems or something because these mm-hmm. keratin mm-hmm. bristles they're baleen that hang down and it, one was recorded almost 10 feet in length 
Uh, and they have, of course, they have hundreds of them, you know, just, just filtering out Filter. the yummy food. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's yeah. just so big. It's incredible. I know, I know, I know, I know. And it's just the one thing I, I, I was curious about, and I thought we could talk about this pod was the blubber. Yes. And, you know, I know you, you said it was, you know, used as the oil of the 18th, 19th, 20th, you know, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And what blubber does for marine mammals is it stores their energy. We talked about, mm -hmm. you know, when those lean months insulates them. So keeps them warm because we're, because we're endotherms. So we need to maintain body temperature, increases their buoyancy so they can float and swim through the water and glide. And so their energy, their, their food energy is, is this blubber is this thick oily layer, right? Of, underneath their skin. So it has both proteins, which is mostly collagen and some fats and lipids. And again, they use this as a, as a search source of energy. And what's interesting was that blubber is actually less dense than water. So that that's what gives them that buoyancy to float. That's why they don't sink. I mean, you have this, what, 200,000 pound animal. Why doesn't it sink to the bottom? Well, it's got all this blubber mm -hmm. that helps it float. And keeps it afloat. No wonder I now, sink so much. Just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a good yeah. swimmer. I, I do a lot of floats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I float pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so what the the whalers uh, what they would do is they would render this and turn it into a waxy substance called whale oil. And whale oil was used in soaps, margarine, and also oil burning lamps because you didn't have electricity back then. So that's what gave light in, in, at night for humans. Now, what's interesting is the natives do eat blubber, the indigenous people. It's called muktuk. And it's this, I think, didn't she talk about that in the interview? I think I remember that. I don't know if she was talking about muktuk or not. But it's, you know, the, the whale blubber and skin. And so it's a great source of energy, vitamin D. But also I thought this was really curious. It's, it's a great source of vitamin C. Interesting. Because how is that even possible? They don't. Yeah, because they don't have citrus, right? They must make it. Humans need. Yeah, we need vitamin C in our diet. Right. That's where scurvy comes right. from. Like the 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 English. The reason the English Navy dominated so well is because they call they fed them limes to get vitamin C to prevent scurvy. Mm -hmm. That's why they call them limeys. You know, we call Brits limeys. It, you know. So, anyways, <laughs> that's interesting. What the concern is. You know, like you said, these indigenous people are still so, wait, eating it. Back at the bus. How do they get the vitamin mm. C? It's in the blubber. Oh, okay, I was gonna say I can't wait. Yeah. I'm like a I'm like a kid at Christmas oh, time. Didn't I say it? I don't sorry. know. Sorry, it, I, I, because I <laughs> <laughs> uh, humans eat it. We need we need it. We, yes. we need to. You know, it's a it's an essential vitamin. We have mm -hmm. to consume mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Huh? So it's right. an, it's so that's not where they essential get it. for them. They make it. Interesting. Well, well no, it's in the blubber, so they eat it. And that's where the uh, the indigenous people get their source of vitamin C. Well, that's now what's super, concerning. That's just that's hold on. That's super. Yeah. <laughs> that's super bizarre because for humans, uh, B and C vitamins are water soluble, so mm -hmm. we they're not fat soluble. So the fat soluble vitamins in humans are D, A, K, and E, and those are the ones that you could quote unquote overdosing because we store them in fat. We don't get rid of them. Humans store them in fat. B and C are water soluble. We don't store them. So you need to, I mean, all, all, obviously all vitamins you need to consume. That's what makes them a vitamin, but you cannot, and I don't, don't quote me on this, but it be, I don't know if there's a case of you know, overdosing on vitamin B and C because your body just excretes it because it's water soluble. Um, so it must be fat soluble in a, um, in a, in a, a bowhead whale, which is interesting to say the least, but obviously humans and whales have a lot of different physiological differences. So I wouldn't be surprised if they have, uh, their metabolism of vitamin C is different or their storage capacity because unlike us humans, Bowhead whales can dive and remain submerged underwater for up to an hour. 
Typically, a single dive is only going to be 9 to 18 minutes, but I know I obviously can't hold my breath for 9 to 18 minutes. Mm -mm. And they're not the deepest divers out there, but they can reach depths of up to 500 feet or 150 meters. So that's... Mm -hmm. That's pretty deep. <laughs> so probably because they have so much blubber, they can't get much lower. Right, right, right. Super interesting. <laughs> but yeah. anyways, what was and your point the, about the, vitamin C? I, I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, so that's the that's how the the indigenous people survived, you know, and and that was where they got their source of vitamin C, and didn't suffer from scurvy. And the the Full last thing circle. I wanted to say Look is at that yeah. whales helping people once again. I love it. Yep, yep, yep. Before we jump into behavior is they are concerned because they are finding in blubber today a lot of toxic substances, you know, again, going back to the oceans and the trash and all those things. So they have high concentrations of PCBs, mm. uh, cancer-causing chemicals, other toxins. Yeah. So these indigenous people eating this blubber that has all this junk in it, you know, so it's... It's a concern of, of scientists and, you know, obviously uh, the health community. Yeah, that's the problem with those but, PCBs is they're around forever. Yeah, yeah I know. Very, very Less plastic. long half-life, yeah. Mm -hmm. Less plastic, everybody. So behavior. They're awesome. And I mentioned mm -hmm. about how they can dive pretty deep and stay submerged underwater. But bowhead whales can leap impressive heights. Even though they're, what, 200,000 pounds we talked about, they're able to breach entirely out of the water. Wow. I know, oh which gosh. makes whale watching even more fun. If you could, That would be fun. Yeah, right? That would be fun to see. So cool. Yeah. I mean, just in- Blue whales don't do that. Blue whales, I don't no. think we saw blue whales breach like that. Mm -hmm. No. Wow. I know hump I know wow, this massive- Yeah. I know humpbacks yeah. uh, breach- uh, mm -hmm. but I don't think they, I don't know if they come all the way out of the water. So, I mean, no, almost, almost yeah. I mean, I've seen some, you send those videos, you know, almost, but not like an orca or something. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, porpoise, that's just a know? lot. That's, that's some strength and some power to, mm -hmm. to get out of the water. And they do, they're slow swimmers. They travel about two to five kilometers per hour or one to two, one to three miles per hour. But they can they can book it if they need to. They can uh, they mm -hmm. can go up to uh, ten kilometers per hour, or about seven miles per hour. Um, mm -hmm. So they they do have some. So they must need some of that speed to help propel themselves out of the water for the breaching behavior. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, they're they're known that uh, they're known that they can get kind of rowdy in the quiet Arctic waters, right? Because you're out there and there's nothing else mm -hmm. around besides sea ice and water and cold. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they might leap out of the water or they'll do some interactive tail and flipper slaps. Um, they're not, they're not as excessively social as some other of the whale species because they typically travel alone or of course, if it's uh, females and small pods of up to six, uh, but they will. So when they're stationary, that's where you maybe find them in bigger groups. But when they migrate during the spring and the fall, They'll kind of segregate into some of these smaller pods of subadults or immediate or mature whales or large adults. And so there may not be as many of them in one group socializing. Right. And yeah, it's, I mean, you're talking about that. I just read that they're very social. So do they, like, I know Humpback, the whale song. So do they have clicks or do they sing? How do they talk? Ah, well, they're awesome. Um, they are highly <laughs> vocal. And once again, even though sometimes they may not travel in these large groups, of course, it's important to be able to locate each other when they need to. And so they use low frequency sounds and their communication is used for traveling, feeding, and of course, socializing um, when it's breeding season or when they are traveling in groups. And they'll also use really intense vocalization or calls to communicate and help them navigate for migration season because obviously they have to migrate, move around um, through large distances. And so and loud vocalizations are really important for that. And during breeding season, which we'll talk a little bit when we get to reproduction, but bowhead whales make these long, complex, really variable mating calls or songs, if you will. Mm -hmm. And a study that looked at bowhead whale communications from 2010 to 2014 near Greenland 
found 184 distinct songs were recorded from a population hmm. of about 300 animals. I mean, that's incredible. Distinct songs, 184 out of 300 animals. And that's what they were able to record. So there's probably more interactions going on that they weren't able to to, uh, to record. So I think, I don't know if as much research has been done with them as far as the different dialects or individual, I know some studies out of uh, certain cetaceans such as dolphins, bowhead whales don't click, but I know in dolphins are talking mm. about having an individual having their own tag, their own name, basically. I couldn't find that that specific type of research has been done in bowhead whales, but what has been done is shown that they definitely have these complex, beautiful, variable songs and calls and that they definitely have their own, uh, for lack of better word, language going on. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. They do. And and, and just mean, in general, we've covered this in a couple of the podcasts uh, where we cover cetaceans, dolphins, and whales, but they're highly intelligent. Uh, I mean, just mm -hmm. incredible. Uh, and I think with whales, baleen whales in particular, we don't even – we're not even at the beginning of understanding it. Whales were able to study mm -hmm. a little bit more, um, whether they're under human care. Obviously, they've been trained and some of them have been trained in things like that to do certain types of quote unquote intelligent testing. But whales, besides their communications, we're just still learning about them. But I mm -hmm. mean, they have huge brains. So that's perhaps one of the most indicative parts about animal intelligence, right? I mean, they have a big size, but their brain just the size of their brain to their body ratio is big, just like it is in humans. Big, Obviously yeah. humans have the biggest, mm -hmm. but we know they're playful. We know they're social. They're amazing communication experts and being part of the whale and dolphin family. I just, I think the bowhead whale is probably under or any baleen whale for that matter is kind of underrepresented in how much we know of what they what they're thinking and what they're feeling yeah 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 I but mean, they've been around for boy we i wish they could teach us a history lesson they've been around for 200 years you know that's we, crazy. i mean they've seen it all and, and yeah, from sailing ships to now modern i you know, know. Oh. and and let's hope ones that are born today are going to be here for another 200 plus years mm -hmm. uh but that's that's up to choices we all collectively as as a world, not just as a country mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. as a conservation podcast, animal podcast, mm -hmm. or as you know, someone from Russia or someone from the United States or whatever it is. It's it's mm -hmm. going to be collectively on decisions we make, ways that we vote with our dollar, people we elect into power, how we handle our own lives and what choices we make, things like that. Uh, because that would be super cool, right? Uh, they're gonna out, they'll mm -hmm. they'll outlive us, right? Yep, yep, yep. No, no, I've read somewhere their their generation interval was like fifty years because they live so long. Well, I mean, Chris, during the heart of the whaling, like commercial whaling, so this is not your indigenous local people hunting whales for survival uh, or for, for subsistence. This is commercial whaling ships from the U.S. from other countries. It's estimated that close to 20,000 bowhead whales were killed in the Bering Street region alone between 19 or between 1848 and 1914. I mean, it's just, it's just, just a massacre, crazy. right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but people started paying attention. And in 1973, the International Whaling Commission started basically putting, you know, putting the brakes on a lot of this commercial whaling. And then even in, uh, um, and in 1987, the Soviet Union got on board too and abolished this commercial whaling. So, I mean, it's, you know, people, so people paid attention, which is good, but the, the but the populations take a while to bounce back um, from such devastation as has definitely been seen in the bowhead whales. And some of this has to do with their generation interval. It takes a long, long time to become mature sexually mature, active bowhead whale. In fact, researchers think the average age of sexual maturity in a bowhead whale is 20 years or so. 
Mm-hmm. And so, but that's that's not necessarily going to say you're start going to start producing calves right when you're 20. And so they have to, you know, usually when they're um, a certain size, at about researchers think that they can start to potentially breed. So that's that's a lot, right? That's I mean, yeah. yeah that's and then time. and then of course their offsprings have to survive. Uh, they, the adult bowhead whales don't have many predators besides humans and pollution and things like that, but uh, the calves can be succumbed to orcas and um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe even, maybe even when they're really young, uh, certain types of seals, I'm not sure. So, but yeah, it's pretty interesting. But the very little that researchers do know about their breeding behavior is that bowhead whales will mate, mating usually occurs during the late winter and early spring. And, of course, the male is going to attract the female with his lovely, complex song. (laughs) And Maybe that's why he breaches. Right, that's probably why he breaches. Mm -hmm. So those would be fun behaviors to watch uh, during whale watching if if you're ever so lucky. Uh, We we don't know, researchers don't know how long pair bonds last um, or if they're monogamous or, um, or not. But what they do know is they, well... More or less, they think that their gestation period is anywhere uh, from 13 to 14 months, but it might be anywhere from up to 16, 17 months. They're just, they're not entirely sure. Mm-hmm. And a female mm-hmm. will give birth to, of course, one calf in April or June or May when the weather, when the water's a little bit warmer. And their breeding interval is three to four years, they think. So it's not like they're spitting calves out every two years. Uh, they take mm-mm. a while because when a calf is born, it's with mama for a long time. It's about four to five meters in length. I just, I just can't even imagine. <laughs> I just I know, can't even imagine that. But, and they, uh, it's just incredible. And they grow one and a half centimeters a day, which once again is just crazy. Uh, and of course they drink their mother's milk for a long time. They'll wean from their mother's milk between nine and 15 months after birth. So that's a huge commitment uh not only for care of the calf but from energy depletion for the mom hopefully she has lots of blubber saved up so it's 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 a big it's a big commitment um and then of course mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when the calf is born the whales will segregate into smaller groups in order to start migrating and uh, the calves and the moms are usually in the front of the group and but the in researchers don't know why that is but they think that it might be a society I don't want to use the word society that researchers have hypothesized that a lot of times when they're traveling in pods or in groups of more than more than two or three or four with a calf and the dam or the the mom being in front might be to help the young one learn how like get better food basically. Because if you're a filter feeder and you're, you know, you're in the front of the pod, you're going to be getting pre-filtered delicious right organism you know <laughs> yeah it's yeah. and stuff so yeah um but pretty interesting and this is this is also something too they th- historically thought what little they did know is that the the moms did everything but there's mm-hmm. but recently there's been reports of males traveling with a mature female and a calf so a mature male mature female and a calf maybe questioning that the male perhaps does have a role in either protection or um, maybe navigation. Who knows? So w- I think there's just still so much to be explored from these guys that have been around for forever. And then talking about that, you know, you, you did talk about their population. I mean, right now, estimates around 20,000 left in the world. And then those certain pockets you talked about, some are considered endangered, especially the one around Greenland. So that's why the U.S. still recognizes them as an endangered species protected by the Endangered Species Act. The right whale, right, their cousin. I just want to highlight mm-hmm. here, right? They're the ones in deep trouble. The as far as the ones north of the equator, so the North Atlantic population, they're endangered. There's less than 500. Mm. And then the North Pacific right whale, there's less than 400. Mm. So not doing well. The Southern right whales are least concerned and they're doing okay in the Southern hemisphere. And obviously these are ones that weren't as whaled as heavily, not as impacted by 
boats and things like that. So definitely something to keep our eyes to. Now, before we jump into the organization, real quick conservation tip of the week. Try to reduce Don't our global whaling. footprint. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's number one. Go whale Angie. watching. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's going to go down in history. Or Can't even better, e- reduce your. Don't even have that carbon footprint traveling. Um, yeah, just watch watch some awesome YouTube videos or nature documentaries. Yeah, yeah, there's some cool ones. There's some cool ones. So here's your tip of the week. So trying to make this more tangible is choose organic or local foods that are in season, because one of the things is transporting food across the planet is you know. You, ships and planes and trucks and all that use fossil fuels. So if you buy local or things that are in season, you'll reduce that your own carbon footprint. Yes. So tips for you who does the shopping. I, I did the shopping for me and my boys. Oh yeah. So John's been shopping winter. a lot lately and we, we have, okay. but we both shop and we, in our family, we, after a lot of research, we are big fans of local and, well, I would even I mean, this once again my own opinion, but I'm even we even prefer local non organic or whatever mm-hmm. over organic mm-hmm. uh, if it's been if yeah, it's been, if yeah, it's been yeah. shipped um, yeah. because it's really that shipping that adds a huge carbon footprint. And I'll just right. whatever wash my it, produce, whatever it is. I'm not. Yeah, the only reason we say organic is not so much health. It's small it farmers uses less pesticides. Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah, and less pesticides, which use you know different chemicals. And again, going back to fossil fuels development, all mm-hmm. that stuff. So, you know, if you can. But here's here's some list of things you can eat in the winter. And I know this doesn't apply to our friends in Australia, maybe down in New Zealand or South of the Equator. But send us but your list your and winter. we'll put it on our show notes because I would <laughs> yes. I love educating and learning about different foods from different So for them, parts. yeah, for them it'll be summer vegetables and fruits, mm, but for us, delicious. yeah, north of the hemisphere and they and they can apply this in the winter down there. Um so winter veggies, broccoli, cabbage, yes, yes. Brussels sprouts. Yum. Carrots, awesome. celery. Sign me up. You know, those are just a few. Winter veggies. Basically think citrus and apples. So your tangerines, grapefruit, oranges, apples and pears are good winter fruits. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. those are probably grown near you that have to transport less distance to your market. So Chris, if you do that. I won't send you one yeah. uh, because I don't want the carbon footprint. But, oh, <laughs> man, our orange tree in our backyard is killing it this year john pruned oh, yeah. the heck out of it which i thought was not good for it but he's mm-hmm. got some farmer in himself too and he he knew it would be and sure enough it went from producing like three oranges to i think we have like 30 out there now and i oh wow and i, oh, I, I gave them as gifts to different people in the family and i keep getting comments anna just texted me while we we're doing this podcast your orange was so amazing <laughs> <laughs> and, they're, and, they're and it was organic. Totally organic. It? We don't do anything, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's so citrus is the way yeah, to go. No. And, and vitamin C's. Yeah. So it keeps, you mm-hmm. don't get there scurvy. You and you can't really yeah. overdose on yeah. it because if you're, now, I don't know if you're a whale, but if you're a human, mm-hmm. you flush it out, right? Uh, excess. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's because it's water soluble. Yeah. So lots of fun tidbits in this podcast today. Yeah. So there you go. Something you do and you reduce your carbon yes, footprint and, a little bit each day. And I just want to, as far as whales uh, in general go, uh, I couldn't really find a organization supporting, supporting just bowhead whales, but mm-hmm. a group that I've talked about a few times on the pod, and I just have to again, because I love their work, is the American Cetacean Society. And so mm-hmm. it's a group, you can find them, acsonline.org. They're also on Facebook. And it's they've been around for geez since 1967 and they're one of the first whale and dolphin and por- a porpoise conservation groups in the world and they bring education current research and critical conservation issues to people who will help do something about it and help save their habitats and they have tons of reliable information i get a lot of my uh, a lot of my material from them and they have student groups and education groups. They have chapters all throughout the United States, uh, different student chapters. And they link people together about different research going on and what can be done. And they have 
uh, they have grant recipients. So we'll put their information on our show notes, but I've talked with them over email a lot in the past. So thank you, Amer- American Cetacean Society for all you do. Mm-hmm. And if there is one um, for any of our other uh, friends that aren't from the United States, if you, if you know one in your area that does good work uh, for whale conservation, please send them our way. And um, we'd be happy to mention them too in a future podcast if they're doing some good research. Yeah. And just, uh, you know, never forget. I mean, this wasn't too much of a downer, you know, of a podcast, you know, even though the Arctic is, is in big trouble, but there's people out there fighting oh, day in, yes. day out for these yeah, animals. The, I mean, yeah. they're ahead of the eight ball. They started in 1967. <laughs> they knew we had to start saving mm-hmm. these guys. So yes, mm-hmm. I mean, it's definitely, um, we need more research though. That's uh, doing this podcast yeah. is also show me that there's so much that, I mean, how do we know so little about the old, you know, the oldest living mammal? Yeah. That's like, yeah. that's got to yeah. change. So uh, groups yeah. out there, dedicated yeah. uh, researchers and, and whether you're a researcher or not, you can still obviously help educate people and share this podcast and share this, uh, share the groups that we share. Right. Uh, if you have mm-hmm. anybody like right now, my Zachary, my three-year-old, he's so cute. He's so into dolphins right now. He just dol- dolphins <laughs> and llamas. It's like in unicorns. Okay. And so, okay. or and, we'll do, we'll do an episode on, on unicorns well, and, and llama we'll corns, which is a jokey <laughs> yeah, a mixture of a unicorn and llama. But anyway, Anyway, it's a different pod for a different day. So, yeah, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I've shown him pictures of uh, of uh, dolphins on their website because they have amazing pictures and always have something on my mm-hmm. Facebook feed from them that's very that's very educational and hopeful. So, mm-hmm. fill up your feed full of whales and dolphins, and you can thank me later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep, we love our oceans and. We will be back next week with a new species. Just, you know, last thing we ask, if you can share this episode, we appreciate it, you know, on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, uh, however you can do it. TikTok's the one that we're going to try to get into. I but anyway, I'm... you can share this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we appreciate it. We appreciate the comments, the, you know, we're trying to get to everybody on Instagram and Facebook. Keep it coming. But thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com Listen. Learn. Share.